Hey. We're all set? All right. So, well, good evening. Thanks for the people that actually braved the weather and the ice and the snow to come out. And I think we probably have a couple people streaming online. But um, tonight I'm talking about a particular type of ship um, that went down on the Great Lakes, and those are foreign vessels. That's why I title it Lost Visitors of the Great Lakes. And you folks get an added bonus. I did this presentation at the college uh, two days ago. And now this is the second presentation I ever put together in my life. And as I was going through it on Tuesday night, I went, wow, this is really bad. <laughs> and so I went home this morning because, of course, we had the snowstorm, so there's no school. So I sequestered myself in my basement, and I fixed it. So you're getting the new and improved and updated version. 2.0. 2.0, absolutely. Um, but these, I have eight stories for you, and they're all ships that came from another country. They, they were true visitors. They were coming here for a cargo, then going back overseas. And I put them, as us historians are likely to do, all in chronological order. So the first one I have to tell you about is one that's really close to home for us. This is the Viator, built in 1904 in Norway. By the way, if you've been to one of my presentations here before and I, you're not used to seeing this, I forgot my clicker tonight, so I feel lost. Uh, but built in Norway in 1904, carrying pickled herring and other miscellaneous products, and I finally found the destination. And I could not tell the people at the college this because um, I just found it yesterday, actually. It was heading for Muskegon. And fittingly, our first story starts on a spooky night, Halloween night, 1935. The Viator is running upbound on Lake Huron, gets off of Thunder Bay here at Alpena, and wouldn't you know it runs into fog, because, you know, we never get fog here. Coming down at the same time is this boat, the Ormadale, running, running along in the same fog, and they wind up actually colliding not too far off Thunder Bay Island. So the Ormondale is going to actually save the crew of the Viator. The Ormondale is going to stay right up against the side of it, right in that collision hole, and the entire crew of the Viator is actually going to jump from one ship to the other, and then they're going to back away, and the Viator is going to go down. The, uh, the captain of the Viator blames the confusion of signals as a reason for the collision, because in 1935, uh, we were really just starting to have foreign vessels come onto the Great Lakes, and there was no universal set of signals. So he heard, or he, he signaled that he was moving in reverse. Once he had figured out the Ormondale was, was nearby, he sounded three blasts on his whistle, which on the oceans meant, danger, I am going in reverse now. Well, on the Great Lakes, that's a fog signal. And so there was a confusion in the signals. And that is why, that's why the, the navigators of both vessels kind of made mistakes. But interestingly, on board the Ormondale, a bigger mistake was made. This guy was actually running the ship. He was the, uh, he was the guy on watch. Now, the, the caption here says, this is Captain Charles Cox. Yes, he had a captain's license, but he was sailing as first mate. The guy who was captain of the Ormondale was asleep in his cabin. And the captain is supposed to be on the bridge in fog. And Captain Cox had been in charge of a ship that wrecked in 1934. Just the year prior, uh, the whaleback Henry Court wrecked at Muskegon. There's a lot of connections here. But so 
Captain Cox is actually in charge of the Ormondale. He's the one that's navigating it because the, the real captain is asleep in his bunk. And so he's actually going to stand trial in this sinking um, because it turns out that he was running right up until the collision or just before the collision. He was running full speed in fog, which, again, you're not supposed to do. And so the, uh, there is the, the usual investigation, and two guys are going to get in trouble. The actual captain of the Ormondale is going to have his license suspended for, for uh, 90 days, I believe it was, because he was not on the bridge when he should have been. And Cox is also going to have his license suspended for 60 days for violating rules of the sea, running in full speed in fog and the likes. The next one to run into trouble is going to be the Walsh Chiff. So the first one, the Viator, is 1935. After that, we're going to have a lot of stories from the 1950s and 1960s because um, we see an increase in foreign traffic on the Great Lakes. And again, there's some, um, uh, just a lot of mistakes are made when a foreign vessel is involved for a lot of reasons. Uh, there was a rule put in place that a foreign vessel has to have a Great Lakes pilot on board. So there has to be someone on board who knows the Great Lakes waterways, who is licensed to pilot a ship through them. Um, but there still seem to be a lot of mistakes. The Walsh Chiff is, is over here in 1953, carrying steel beams again to Muskegon. And here's what happens with the Walsh Chiff, October 2nd, 1952. At Port Huron, Michigan, the Walsh Chiff is actually upbound in the St. Clair River. Coming down is the Pioneer, which is your typical Great Lakes freighter. Now, typically here at this part of the river, what two ships will do is they will pass port to port or left side to left side. As the Pioneer comes under the Blue Water Bridge and he looks down river, he sees the Walsh Chiff and he realizes the Walsh Chiff is right up against the American shoreline. There's not room for him to pass port to port. So the captain of the Pioneer assumes, okay, we're going to pass starboard to starboard or right side to right side. And so he alters his course to do that. So he's coming down. He's going to pass starboard to starboard. And at the last second, it's almost like the pilot on board the Walsh Chiff realized his mistake. And he makes a hard right turn across the river in front of the Pioneer. And so the Pioneer, he does everything he can. He drops his stern anchor. He puts the boat in full reverse, does everything he can to avoid a collision. He winds up crashing into the port side stern of the Walsh Chiff, and the Walsh Chiff is going to go down pretty quickly. Fortunately, help was already nearby. There was a mail boat in Port Huron in those days. The J.W. Westcott Company, they still run the mail boat in Detroit, but in 1952, they also ran a mail boat in Port Huron. And so Mr. McKinnon ran the boat, and he had just gone out to deliver mail, and he also checked the names of the vessels because he would send reports back to uh, company owners to let them know that their ship had passed that point. And he was on the way back, and he heard a crunch. And he knew that he shouldn't hear a crunch when two ships were involved. And so he turned around, and he went back, and he starts picking up the crew of the Walsh Chiff. By the time he gets there, the Pioneer has already put down their lifeboat, and they're picking up uh, Walsh Chiff crewmen as well. Uh, McKinnon picks up two guys in his boat, and then starts hearing yelling for help. And it's the Walsh Chiff's captain. He's up in the crow's nest, hanging on, hanging on to the crow's nest to stay out of the water, and they wind up getting him. No lives are lost in the Walsh Chiff sinking, except for one. And believe it or not, it was not one of the German crewmen. It was the Great Lakes pilot. It was, it was Captain Patterson. He's a Canadian, and he was the one in charge of navigating the Walsh Chiff while he was on Great Lakes waters. And uh, they believe that he had a heart attack. The third mate remembered seeing him running to his cabin after the collision. And the next time they saw him, they, they were pulling him out of the river. So they don't really uh, understand why he was lost. He shouldn't have been lost in the sinking. So they're thinking he may have actually had a heart attack from the stress of the collision, everything that was going on. The Coast Guard's going to have their inquiry. And as we all know, nothing stops the U.S. Postal Service. Not rain, not sleet, not snow, not Coast Guard Board of Inquiry. 
And so they're going to have their inquiry at the J.W. Westcott mail boat office. So Mr. McKinnon can keep running out and bringing the mail out to the boats. And they tell him, we understand what your job is. You just keep doing what you do. We're going to ask you some questions. If you need to leave to go do your job, that's fine. We'll wait for you. And they regret that decision. These guys spend hours at the mailboat office sitting around waiting for McKinnon to come back. They're, they're trying to figure out what happened in the sinking, and their star witness keeps leaving. He just keeps running out there and going out to the next boat to bring mail. And eventually, at one point, he was actually eating his lunch on the witness stand. They're trying to ask him questions, and he's eating a ham sandwich. Finally, they do get all their, all their facts together. They talk to other witnesses, and they determine that the blame was with the German vessel. He was in the wrong part of the river, and by doing that, he caused the accident. The wall shift will be salvaged. The first story I told you, the Viator, it's still on the bottom in about 188 feet of water. Uh, the wall shift being right in the middle of the St. Clair River, you can't just leave it there. It was patched up, raised up, and taken away. My next story is the Prince Willem V. And there's, this boat had a unique history even before it actually went to work. So I put in here, built in 1948. I should have put finished in 1948. It was, construction began during World War II. It wound up being launched prematurely and scuttled to the bottom of a harbor so the Nazis couldn't use it. After the war, they raised it up, finished building it, and put it into service. And it is going to be carrying a little bit of everything. This is kind of like a floating ACE hardware. You can see it's carrying uh, horsehair, and, uh, gas engines, aluminum, kitchenware, motor compound, automobile parts, leather, a little bit of everything. And he's bound for Sarnia, Ontario. <coughs> Excuse me. On October 14th, 1954, here's what's happening. The Prince Willem V is on its way out of Milwaukee. He's loaded a partial cargo. He's on his way to Sarnia to go load more. It's a clear night, no storm, no fog. And so they decide to not turn on their radar. They'll regret that decision. So the Willie, as they called it, Prince Willem V is a little bit of a mouthful to keep saying, so they called it the Willie. He leaves... He leaves Milwaukee, and they see the Sinclair Chicago coming up their way. Now, that's a tugboat. They spot the tugboat, and they know that he's heading to Milwaukee that they had just come out of. So what, what the navigators do on the Prince Willem is they adjust course to go south, and then they're going to pass behind the tugboat. Okay, They're going to get out of his way and then pass behind him so no one really has to uh, run any risk of a collision. Here's where they wish they turned on their radar. It was nighttime. They could see the tugboat. What their eyes could not see was the barge it was towing. This is not a tugboat like you would see on the Mississippi River where they're pushing the barge. They're, they're towing it. And there are supposed to be lights on the barge, and apparently there were not. And the, the tugboat is supposed to display a certain light light set up to signify that they have a barge under tow. The officers on the Prince Willem didn't see it. So when they turn to go back east, they actually sail between the tugboat and the barge. And so the captain of the tugboat sees what's happening, and they, he immediately uh, blows the danger signal on his whistle, which is five short blasts. He starts dropping the tow cable, and he turns a spotlight on the barge. He starts playing that tow cable out. He's trying to lay it on the bottom. And so the, so the Willem can just sail over the top. He's not quite fast enough. So the Prince Willem is going to actually snag that tow hawser and pull the barge right into its side. It's going to punch about a 19-foot hole in the side of the Prince Willem, and it's going to go to the bottom. Again, no lives are lost. The entire crew is able to get off the Prince Willem. Um, but you still have a large vessel on the bottom of Lake Michigan with a lot of valuable cargo. And so you have to figure out what you're going to do with that. In the course of the investigation, because the Coast Guard still wants to know why this happened on a clear night, right? So the Coast Guard opens up its, uh, 
its investigation. And the, the tugboat captain says, you know, I gave him a warning. I, I did turn on my spotlight. Uh, there were lights on the barge. Now, the, bar, the, the lights on a tow barge is supposed to be on a, on a mast. This particular barge did not have one. So he said they were portable units, and I fastened them to the towing bits. Okay. Well, when the Coast Guard went aboard, because neither the tugboat or the barge sank. So when the Coast Guard went aboard the barge, they, one, didn't find the lights he was talking about. Two, didn't find any place where they'd been fastened. So they either were never there, or the whole unit got knocked off in the collision. Really never could figure out exactly which one was the case. Ultimately, the tug and barge are held responsible for the sinking. Uh, the, the line that owns the Prince Willem files suit for the loss of their ship. Ultimately, that lawsuit's gonna be dismissed because they settled out of court for I think about $200,000. Uh, so the, the outcome of the sinking was the tug and barge were held responsible, but you still had the ship on the bottom. Initially, they thought they might be able to raise the ship. Uh, a salvage crew goes in, they tried to raise it, it didn't work. Some of the salvage pontoons are still down there next to it uh, from the failed salvage attempt. Some divers did get down there and at least salvage part of the cargo. And then the Coast Guard is doing a survey of the wreck because eventually the owners just abandoned the Prince Willem. They're like, we can't, we can't raise the thing, it's just down there for good now. Uh, so the Coast Guard surveys the wreck and it comes up, they had this magic line of 40 feet. Anything above 40 feet uh, from the surface is deemed a hazard to navigation. So they put a marker on it and they, the Coast Guard put out bids for someone to come in and either dynamite the wreck or go in and cut out or cut off the parts of the boat that were up, or coming up too close to the surface. And one guy won the bid. He put in a bid of $50,000 to go down and lower the wreck below that 40 foot mark. And the Coast Guard says, the job is yours. He goes down there. The Prince Willem is laying completely on its side on the bottom. When he goes down there, he finds out the only part of this, of this vessel that is sticking up above that 40 foot line is an open gangway door that's sticking up on its hinges. So he went over and pushed the door over and came back up and said, I want my 50,000. Most expensive door in Great Lakes history. There was some legal wrangling. The Coast Guard tried to not pay that much for a door. I think he wound up getting 40,000 for it because the courts pretty much held him responsible. Like you took the bid. Next time, send a Coast Guard diver down to see what you're dealing with before you hire somebody. And we go to the Monrovia, built in 1943 in Scotland, and he's hauling uh, steel from Belgium to, uh, part of the load's gonna go to Duluth, and part of it's gonna go to Chicago. And this is another one that is what I would call a local wreck. The Monrovia, on June 25th, 1959, is actually upbound on Lake Huron, and he's gonna meet this guy that's in the picture, the Royalton. Again, it's fog off Thunder Bay, and there's some confusion with some signals, and they run into each other. And, uh, the Monrovia ultimately is going to sink in fairly deep water. It's still down there. And you can see that the Royalton gets a bent up nose. The Royalton does not sink. Uh, as soon as the collision happens, the, the crew of the Monrovia, who is Greek mostly, they do a quick survey of their vessel. They decide that it's going down. They all get in the lifeboat put out a SOS, and they abandoned ship. Fortunately, there were other ships in the area uh, to come help. And so the, the crew of the Monrovia is going to be picked up by the Norman W. Foy. And here's a picture of him bringing the guys on board. They're, in, they're already in the vicinity. They hear the SOS call. They come over. They find the lifeboat in the fog. They pull them all on board. And then they wait because you do have a sinking ship out there in the fog. That is a hazard to navigation. Someone needs to monitor the situation. And so the FOI with the, with the crew of the Monrovia stands by and they're watching the Monrovia on their radar and they're watching it on their radar and they continue to watch it on their radar. Uh, eventually some of, the, some of the crewmen of the Monrovia get back in their lifeboat, go back to their sinking ship, get their personal effects, get the ship's papers, and come back to the FOI. And then they continue to watch it on their radar. 
it takes that ship 11 hours to sink. You would think, if they had time to do all that, they, there's probably something you could have done to save the ship. Instead of just standing in the wheelhouse of your rescuer, watching your ship on radar not sink for 11 hours. But there wasn't even a more dramatic rescue. Some of the rescuers had to be rescued. Because not only did the Norman W. Foy respond to the SOS, so did the Coast Guard. Two guys from the Alpena Light Station went out in the motor lifeboat, and they got off Thunder Bay Island, and the fuel pump and their motor quit. And they couldn't go anywhere. So now it's fog. You have two guys in an open lifeboat with a dead motor. And it gets a little scary for them, because they're also in the shipping lane. At one point, they were actually bouncing around on the wake of a passing freighter. They were right in the shipping lanes. So all this is going on, there's a, there's a rescue going on, there's a ship sinking, there's other freighters going by, and these two guys are out in a glorified motorboat with no power. They did say they were never lost, but they did admit to being a little scared. Um, there was a piece of canvas or a tarp in there, and one guy actually rigged a makeshift sail and got them back underway. Uh, but they were missing for 23 hours out there on Lake Huron in the fog in a dead boat. The drama is not completely done, so the FOI is going to take the crew of the Monrovia to Detroit. And when they get there, they're going to have a brief mutiny. So they get off the FOI, they get put on a bus, and they're being taken to a hotel. And when they get there, they just decide they're not getting off the bus. Um, when, they, when they were dropped off by the FOI, the immigration officers took all of their paperwork, all their passports. I presume they got their passports off when, when they went back to the sinking ship. Um, and without any official documents, they refused to get off the bus. And um, they said they had 30 days of paid leave. They wanted that. They were entitled to survivor's pay for their ship going down. They weren't going anywhere without their passports. My favorite quote, of course, this is, you know, early Cold War era, and one of the sailors actually shouted at an immigration officer that this is the United States, not Russia. Give me my passport. <laughs> they, were, uh, they were a little bit concerned. Um, the crew describes how their ship went down. I'm sure they tried to hide the fact that it took 11 hours. And interestingly, the second officer on board the Monrovia actually blames his captain. He says, we were not where we were supposed to be. My captain's the reason why we were in a collision. There were no articles about the captain's reaction to that. I'm guessing they didn't sail together again. Just a guess. So the, the Monrovia is still down there as part of the, uh, the sanctuary here in Alpena, down there in deep water. And then this one. The Francisco Marazin. Excuse me. It's another German ship carrying just a mixed general cargo, kind of like the Prince Willem V. He is carrying a little bit of everything, kind of that floating ace hardware that I described. And in case you're thinking that maybe all my stories involve collisions, it most of them do. It does, you know, these foreign vessels come in. It seems a little bit like bumper cars sometimes. I kind of wonder where these guys got their piloting licenses. The Francesco Marazin is actually in a storm. He's upbound on Lake Michigan on November 29th, 1960, and the captain is in his first command. He's a very young captain. He's 24 years old, and he's a full-blown captain of the ship, and that is incredibly young for that position. And he loses his bearings in this storm, and he actually crashes ashore at South Manitou Island. Irony of ironies, he actually goes over another shipwreck on his way to becoming a shipwreck. The Walter Frost was a wooden wreck that had sunk there years before, and the Marazin actually bounces over that wreck on its way to the rocks to become the latest shipwreck. And he's going to strand right there on South Manitou Island, 300 feet or so from shore. Not very far offshore at all. And there he is. And initially, they're thinking that they can salvage this boat. 
But the weather, of course, is going to get in the way, as it always does. Uh, the storm keeps lingering for a few days. Uh, a couple Coast Guard cutters are right there. And, but with the storm and the waves, they can't get in there. Remember, this thing went ashore. It went on the rocks. So a, another ship can't go up next to it, or they would punch holes in their bottom. And then with the storm, uh, motor lifeboats couldn't get in there. But the, the ship seems pretty stable, and so they're just going to hang out there and wait for the storm to pass. But they do make one rescue. They take the captain's wife off because she was, she was pregnant. They decided late November, in a storm, on a shipwreck, maybe not the place to leave a pregnant lady. So they, the Coast Guard did come in and airlift her off the ship, left the crew uh, there. A salvage crew finally is able to get aboard the Mirazin, and they start poking around and looking, and they go, you know, this might be a bigger job than we thought. Um, we, we need some extra pumps here. This thing is really taking a beating. Eventually, they do come in. Um, once the weather's calmed down, the Coast Guard comes in and takes uh, all the guys off the boat. All 14 of them are taken to Traverse City. And they're all just going to wait. They're waiting for the salvagers and the owners to get together and do their surveys and figure out how can we salvage this boat? What is our plan of action here? And she's still there. They never could salvage this thing. It is still there. Parts of it are still above the water. Um, pretty much just that midsection that you see, like the bow has been broken off by the ice now. It's pretty much just the middle part. You can see it from the, uh, from the shipping lanes. I've seen it a few times out there on my boat. So you sail by and you get this nice grim reminder of what can happen if your captain screws up. And then you look in the wheelhouse and you realize that your captain's not 24 years old and you're probably safe. Then we have the Montrose. The Montrose is actually flying a flag that you don't see a lot on the Great Lakes. It's visiting from Great Britain and is stopping uh, in Windsor, Ontario, unloading a cargo of wine and olives. Sounds so much more fun than the stone and iron ore that my boat hauls. I don't know if the cargo of wine contributed to the accident, but uh, who knows? So they're unloading that, or excuse me, at Detroit, and then they're going to, uh, they're going to load some other stuff, aluminum, to take it up to Fort William, Ontario, which is now Thunder Bay, Ontario. Here's what's happening. You can see the Montrose right there in Detroit. <coughs> and so this, this boat down here at the bottom, the T.J. McCarthy, he's coming up. He's actually going to the dock the Montrose is at. And if that boat looks a little funny, this is kind of one of those fun factoids of Great Lakes shipping. He's a traditional Great Lakes freighter, but you see that large flight deck on, on his, uh, in the middle there. Those aren't airplanes that are sitting on it. Those are cars. Back in the day, that is how they transported brand new automobiles around the Great Lakes region, is they would load them on a freighter and sail them around. And yes, there is a car collector's dream at the bottom of the Great Lakes. There are some vintage 1920s to 1960s cars all over the bottom of the Great Lakes, if anyone could figure out how to bring them up. But the McCarthy is heading to the same dock the Montrose is at. So he's slowing down. He's expecting the Montrose to leave. And... Um, he actually does talk to the Montrose on the radio, and he says, okay, I'm going to slow down, and you can go ahead and leave before I pull in there. And you have this other boat up here at the top, the B.H. Becker. That's a tugboat. And this one is kind of like what you would see on the Mississippi River. He's pushing a barge. So the McCarthy's coming up, and he's waiting for, he's expecting the Montrose to leave. And the Becker is coming down the river. He's not expecting the Montrose to leave. And all of a sudden, the Montrose just comes out and never issued a security call. When you leave a dock, they are required to issue a security call telling all vessels in the area that they are about to depart the dock and what their intentions are. And he turns right in the path of the Becker and the barge that it's pushing. And so that barge slams right into the port side bow of the Montrose. And so um, the captain of the Montrose immediately heads for shore. He just rings up full ahead, and he is going to head for the Canadian shore and try to beach the vessel before he, before he sinks. 
Again, there will be no loss of life on the Montrose either. But he's not going to make it to the shore. And you can see why in this picture. Okay, it kind of reminds you of the movie Titanic, right? The bow's going down, the stern's coming up. Well, he gets to this point where the prop and the rudder come out of the water and he can't maneuver anymore. He can't steer, the propeller's out of the water, and so he's, he's really dead in the water. Well, the Detroit River has got a heck of a current. And so now, not only is he sinking, he's being pushed by the current. And so the crew all abandon ship, and he's going to end up here. He's going to roll over and go down right underneath the Ambassador Bridge. So if you've ever been to Detroit, been, been by the Ambassador Bridge, you have been to the site of this shipwreck. And it got to be uh, quite the scene. People were actually taking their kids down to go see the shipwreck. They were making day trips from around the state to go see this. And the Coast Guard had to you know, warn the pleasure boaters because they all wanted to go see it up close and personal. The Coast Guard opens up their hearing on the, on the whole issue because they're trying to figure out how does this happen, right? As again, there was, a, there was a Canadian pilot on board. There was a Great Lakes licensed pilot on board the Montrose. How do we have this, how do we have this occur in the middle of the Detroit River? And really, all the witnesses say something different. The McCarthy says, I never, I talked to him on the radio and told him, go ahead and leave before I get there. I'll wait for you. But I never heard a security call. And the pilot on the Montrose says, I issued one and got no answer from anyone. The captain of the tugboat says, I never heard one. So who knows? Most likely no security call was issued. And the Montrose was eventually patched up and put back into service because you can't leave a boat in the middle of the Detroit River. Someone had to do something with it. Now we get to the Emstein, another German ship. We do a lot of international trading with Germany in this era. And he's bound for Kenosha, Wisconsin. This one gets slightly confusing, so bear with me here with all my animations. It gave me a headache putting it together. He's actually going to collide with another foreign ship in the St. Clair River, right off of St. Clair, Michigan. So we have the Olympic Pearl up here at the top of the screen. He's coming down the river. And you see the Buckeye there to the right. He is actually on, on the Canadian side. Uh, that's a typical Great Lakes freighter. And the M. Stein is coming up. Okay. Now something was weird with the Olympic Pearl. We still don't understand exactly what. Two other ships had passed it in the river uh, on its way down and had called them on the radio and said, we, we're having trouble seeing you. Your deck lights aren't on. Ships have rows of, of deck lights along the sides. So we, we can't see you. And, and both times, allegedly, the crew went out to check them and they said, they're on. So either the crew was lying or something about the design of the Olympic Pearl made made it difficult to see those lights. And so maybe that played into some of it with the M. Stein trying to pass the Buckeye um, right there. Maybe he didn't see the Olympic Pearl. Well, the Pearl looks up ahead, sees these two boats, and he is actually going to try to pass them both right down the middle. So he's going to split them. Um, that's his plan. So he, he issues the appropriate signals with his whistle, he gives a one whistle blast to the Buckeye, saying, I'm going to pass you port to port, or left side to left side. And he issues a two whistle blast to the M. Stein, saying starboard to starboard, or right side to right side. The, the M. Stein replied with a one whistle. So now you have two captains who have two different plans on how to pass on different sides. So what ends up happening is the M. Stein actually crosses right in front of the Olympic Pearl. And so they smash into one another, and uh, the M. Stein is actually able to get to shore. Okay, so even though he does technically sink, he actually does he is able to beach the vessel. There was, and no one was lost on the M. Stein for two reasons. One, a person actually on shore heard the collision because apparently on October 6, 1966, it was really nice weather out because the desk sergeant at the state police post had his window open. And he actually heard the whistles, heard the collision, and immediately dispatched the state police rescue boat. And they went out and picked guys out of the river. 
And then he had to call in off-duty officers to come in and direct traffic because St. Clair turned into a traffic jam of everyone wanting to stop and watch the boat sink. The other reason why no one was lost on the Emstein, and here you can see it run up on shore. The picture is not the greatest, but you can kind of see how the, the port bow is kind of crumpled there. This collision left a 40-foot hole in the side of the ship. The other reason why no one was lost on the Emstein, the crew had a tradition. Every evening, um, anyone who wasn't on duty would get together in the rec room and play cards except that night. For whatever reason, they never, they never specified why they decided not to have a card game that night, and the crew rec room was exactly where the Olympic Pearl crashed into her side. Had the card game been going on, several crewmen would have been lost, not in the sinking, but in the collision. The captain is what we call an optimist. He declared that a 40-foot hole in his boat was no big deal, and he was going to finish his trip. The owners, the Coast Guard, and uh, I'm sure his crew had a different idea. He didn't. So the salvagers go on board. They figure out a plan. They're hoping to raise the Emstein in 18 days. They beat their goal by three days. It took them 15 days to patch up the Emstein and uh, tow it out of there. And then everyone's favorite from this region, the Nordmere. <coughs> Another German freighter carrying a cargo of rolled steel bound for Chicago. And I would love to tell you that there's this big dramatic story of November 19th, 1966. It's a clear night, no fog, no storm. They just took a wrong turn. There is a reef out there and it is lighted with a flashing lighted buoy, and they simply went to the wrong side of the buoy and crashed onto the rocks. And yes, there was a Great Lakes pilot on board, so we're still not sure how they managed this, um, but initially, it looks like she can be salvaged. Here's a picture of her. Um, yes, she tore the bottom out, but this, this boat should be able to be salvaged, and so, What's gonna end up happening is the Coast Guard is going to bring most of the crew here to Alpena, except for eight guys. Captain Steinbeck and seven other guys are gonna stay on board to protect the salvage rights because if the ship is abandoned, someone else could go out there and claim the ship for salvage. So eight guys are gonna be living on a, on a shipwreck, waiting to be salvaged. Um, at one point, one of the office, a couple of the guys brought one of the lifeboats into Alpena to come grocery shopping and take food back out to the boat. That's, that's got to be a fun grocery shopping trip right there. And the, uh, the first officer has a camera, so they're hanging out out there just mugging for the camera, taking some pictures of what it's like out there on a sunken ship. And they're just waiting. There is every expectation that the Nordmere will be patched up, refloated, and put back into service. Until 10 days later, November 29th, 1966, now a storm rolls in. And if you are on a grounded ship, a storm is a big deal because waves have a lot of force. And when the ship can't move with the wave, they just beat the vessel to death. And that's what's gonna end up happening to the Nordmere. The first officer actually got pictures. It's not high, high resolution, but you can see this wave crashing over the side of the Nordmere. There's eight guys on board this thing and it starts going to pieces. The keel snaps. Pieces of the side are, are being punched in. Holes are being punched in the boat. They are in trouble. This thing very likely is going to disintegrate around them and they're gonna go in the water. So they start issuing an SOS call, which interestingly, is not heard in Alpena. We have a Coast Guard station here. There are guys on Thunder Bay Island. Someone should have heard that distress call and no one did. It's actually an FCC station down all the way downstate in Allegan, Michigan, who picks up the SOS. And they said it was very faint, so they're thinking they're probably using an auxiliary radio, maybe a battery-powered radio. But it's someone way down there that picks up the SOS. And initially, 
they send the Coast Guard cutter Mackinac to go help, the one that's now a museum boat up in Mackinac City. Well, again, kind of like with the Francisco Morazan, the Nordmere is on the rock, so the, the Mackinac really can't go in there, can't get in there to effect a rescue, so the Coast Guard sends a helicopter. And they come up from downstate, they stop in Oscoder for fuel, they're flying out over the lake, and they're out to go find these guys, and they can't find them. And they're, they're looking, uh, you're in the middle of a storm, you got snow, high winds, it's nighttime, they're struggling to, to find, every, find this, this boat in the middle of Lake Huron. It's, there's a lot of space out there. And so they're looking, they're trying to figure out their next plan. They're thinking about turning around, coming back, uh, de-icing the helicopter because they're starting to take ice at this point, maybe get some more fuel. And the pilot says, two more minutes, two more minutes, and then we'll, we'll turn around and we'll, we'll refuel. They get out there at almost exactly two minutes. There's a lull in the storm and the clouds part, and lo and behold, there's the Nordmere below them. And so they wind up, now they have not to figure out what to do because their helicopter is not designed for 10 guys. Remember, there's eight guys on the Nordmere plus the two pilots. They can't carry 10. So they wind up airlifting these guys one person at a time. So they pull them up, fly them over to the Mackinac, lower them back down onto a Coast Guard cutter that's bobbing around like a cork. That's some pretty good flying. They get all eight of them off. And then they just disappear from the headlines because the same day, the same time as these eight guys are getting rescued, the Daniel J. Morell is getting ripped in half further down Lake Huron and taking 28 men with her. So most people have never heard of the rescue of the eight guys aboard the Nordmere because the next day, this is the headline. Another ship went down. 28 men were lost while eight more were being saved. In all likelihood, that, that Coast Guard helicopter flew within 100 miles of the Morel as it was going down. Certainly, certainly would have flown fairly close to the life raft where there were four guys on board. Ultimately, only one of them is going to survive. So some lived and some were lost simply based on the ability to send an SOS call. So the, the crew of the Nordmere are all rescued. They're brought here to Alpina. They are, arrangements are made to send them back home to Germany, and they all leave, except one. One crewman of the Nordmere stayed here for the rest of their life. Allow me to introduce you to Goofy. Goofy is a two-year-old Canary Dale who is the ship's mascot. He's also a world traveler, quite literally. As a two-year-old pup, Goofy had circumvented the globe six times. Well, they... Um, the, they arranged for the crew to go home so quickly, and I, it didn't specify the problems. I don't know if it was because putting a dog on an airplane, I don't know. But Goofy wasn't able to go home, so he was, he was lodged at the Alpena County Sheriff's Department. They started putting ads in the Alpena <coughs> News asking for someone to please adopt Goofy. And I, I can tell you, because it was reported in the newspaper, because everyone wanted to know what happened to Goofy. He was adopted by a nice family in, uh, on Lewis Street, he lived here the rest of his life, never went sailing again, and I think he learned to bark in English, too. And those are the six boats that had a wildly different experience on the Great Lakes than they planned on when they got here. End of story.